What's up, everybody? I'm Elizabeth Wamel, a software engineer on the data-oriented tech stack team. And I'm here to tell you about the best way to approach designing your game systems to take advantage of the new high-performance ECS features that we've been working on. So first, a little background. ECS stands for Entity Component Systems, which is probably something you've heard of already. But if you're not already on the ECS hype train, it's a core part of the data-oriented tech stack. ECS is comprised of a collection of packages that enable you to get performance by default. We showcased it with Megacity, where you can see just absolutely massive numbers of entities running at frame rates that you would not be able to achieve with regular game objects. And the reason it's so fast is because it's built around using data-oriented design, which is distinctly different from what you're used to with object-oriented design. Which brings me to my next section here. What's actually the motivation for this talk and what I want you to get out of it? So while getting people ramped up on ECS, both inside and outside of Unity, I've seen some patterns. Uh, we're creatures of habit. And object-oriented programming is a very, very old habit for a lot of us. My hope is that by pointing out some of these old habits and assumptions, you can avoid some of the pitfalls that are common to trying data-oriented design out for the first time. Uh, I also hope that this gives you some perspective on the actual difficulty level of data-oriented design. It's definitely a lot different, but it's not like intrinsically more complicated. So let's just take a step back re-examine our thinking and expand our performance horizons. All right, so object-oriented design or programming or just OOP, because it's quicker to say, it's a design pattern. And at this point, it's one that's just ubiquitous throughout pretty much all software. And Unity has been no exception to this until really recently. So OOP is so ubiquitous. In fact, you may not even realize how baked into your programmer worldview it is. Uh, so to understand where we need to go to get the performance, like you saw in Megacity, let's first take a step back and kind of understand where we are. So if you look up object-oriented design on Wikipedia, there are basically like five pillars. Information hiding, also called encapsulation, which really just boils down to like read-write permissions. Um, classes, interfaces, polymorphism, and inheritance. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on classes and inheritance because they're really the most important pieces to unlearn to really think about data-oriented design properly. Right, so classes, this is just a review. Classes are tightly coupled sets of data and functions that act on that data. So the idea is that any object instantiated from this class should be able to act upon its own data with whatever methods it has. Right, so you guys have probably seen something like this before. It's a classic example. We have this class called animal. It has some data, position, health, energy, whatever, whether or not it's dead. Uh, the whole idea is that what any in, an instance of this class should be able to operate on its own data, like a real, actual, conceptual object. So any object, animal object should be able to feed itself, move itself, draw itself, whatever. And you know this example maps really well to object-oriented design. Lots of potential objects with their own data and functionality. So building on that, next thing is inheritance. Objects can be other types of objects, so let's organize them that way and save ourselves some trouble, right? <laughs> uh, right, so let's say we realize in this example, well, actually, not all animals eat other animals. Some of them eat plants, right? So plants have a lot of the same things as animals, position, life, whether or not it's alive, you know. But they can't move or eat, and, and that's if you ignore Venus flytraps for a minute. But anyway, so we have a super set of objects in real life for both animals and plants, right? We have organisms. And... Uh, you know, we can just put the animal and plant common data in here, and then they can both have it, and we don't have to type it again. So now it's reusable, right? Uh, well, <laughs> now we can generalize what animals need to be other organisms and add a flag to animal for whether or not it's other animals. But anyway, yeah, I'm sure you can see like the void of how deep this inheritance hierarchy can get, especially if you're a like, huge bio nerd like me. Right, so anyway, if you keep jamming on this idea, you get this kind of nasty class diagram with a bunch of different organisms and this like rat's nest of caveats and their functionality. And we don't even have them interacting yet. So uh, that's how you get bugs like cameras that can die somehow because they ended up with HP. Without even looking at performance, like you can see the OOP gets you in a lot of trouble. All right, so now let's look at how OOP is also a recipe for grossly misusing your hardware. But first, let's actually talk about the hardware. Um, as you may have heard, Moore's Law is kind of not a thing anymore. So CPUs are incredibly fast now. Memory mm, hasn't really kept up. 
uh, which you're about to see is the source of a lot of trouble. Uh, thankfully, hardware designers have given us some very powerful tools to work around it, one of the most powerful of which is the ridiculously fast memory at the top of the memory hierarchy, which is the cache. So caches, they're designed around a couple of assumptions. A lot of computation tends to have either spatial or temporal locality, which just basically means that pieces of data that we need for a bunch of related operations are probably close to each other in memory, or data that we just used for an operation, we're probably going to need it again pretty soon. So to kind of give you an example of memory speeds and size, this is kind of not to scale, but let's pretend. Uh, this is a really rough representation of loading things from different parts of memory. So don't blink. Loading something from the L1 cache. It's like nearly instant. It's very fast. OK, so L2 cache. Again, really fast, a little bit slower, but still pretty fast. Meanwhile, loading from main memory, it is going. You just have to wait for it. Yeah, so, and keep in mind, this is also twice as fast as I wanted to display it, but we have some limitations here, so, right. Right, so if we know the cache is small, but it's really fast, and relies on the assumption that the data we care about is close together, how well does object-oriented programming, how well does an object-oriented program work with modern memory architecture? Well, let's visualize it. So, let's take the example before with like animals, and you know, say we have a bird something that we want to move around. If you really squinted at that class diagram I had up there for a second, uh, you might have seen that bird inheritance inherits from a couple of other classes with a bunch of member variables. So we have you know, a character pointer from genetic entity, a vector three position, which has three floats, uh, an int and a bool from organism, and just a couple of bools from animal, and then a few bird-specific variables. We can see here, if you look up at the top right there, our bird class is 56 bytes in size. So we can also see that we have a whole eight bytes of padding with those alignment members, which is like having a whole extra float, except we don't actually have a whole extra float. So let's do like a really simple you know, game kind of thing. You know, loop through the list of the birds and call their move function. Maybe it looks something like this. You know, pretty straightforward. Update the bird's position based on some controller input and delta time. So let's load our, bird from mem our birds from memory and start processing their positions. So here's our 64-byte cache line split up into 8-byte chunks, so it's just a little bit easier to visually parse. And here's what our 56-byte birds look like loaded into the cache. And here are the birds' positions, i.e. the only part of the birds that we're actually doing anything with right now. We're wasting nearly 80% of our cache right here with stuff we don't care about. Memory controllers are going to load a full cache line uh, regardless of whether or not you use all 64 bytes of one. And given how long it takes to load something from main memory, we should really be making use of as many of these lightning fast bytes as possible. Oh yeah, and remember uh, how move is defined as a virtual function in the animal class if you like really squinted and caught that? Uh, if the compiler doesn't inline that for you, you also have to wait for your function call to load off a of B table from memory. So you've got a double whammy of unfortunate things. And none of that is very cash money. The more time we spend for, you know, stuff, wait, the more time we wait for things to load memory, the more time we're just burning energy doing nothing. Actually, this is worse than doing nothing because memory operations cost a lot more energy than just idling, which translates to hotter devices, shorter battery life, dead chips, all the things that we love to hate on. Right, so what's the alternative? As you might imagine from the name, data-oriented design is about designing software around data, your data, as in like the real actual data you have, not some like ab abstract model of how you think your data should work. So let's apply this to the bird example. Looking at that data, how can we make this better? Well, we only really needed 12 bytes of position data per bird out of that 56 byte structure when we're moving them. So let's only load and process position data. Let's pack all those positions into an array and just like blast through them. Look at how many we can show through there. This data is packed way more efficiently. And uh, you might recognize this as a classic structure of arrays versus array of structures. Setting up your data in continuous arrays like this makes for much, much better data locality and thus much better cache utilization. And this is exactly what components do for you in ECS. This is all set up for you. So how do you do something analogous in your game? Well, think about it this way. 
Ultimately, all software takes in some data as input, processes it, and gives it back to you. Gives, gives you back some data as output. Right, so at a really high level, like just do the opposite of object or agent programming. Think about everything you do as setting up systems to read from and write to memory instead of directing objects to like manipulate themselves and each other. Map out your dependencies early, often, and at as high resolution you can, and be aggressive with marking data as read only so you can paralyze work and you can avoid data races. This is opposed to you know, encapsulation and thinking about how weird interactions will happen with your objects. Uh, instead of looping over every object error in search of you know, a very small few with certain properties, you can just select the data with the properties you need and just go through that. So let's look at the, these don'ts and a few other things in the context of ECS. So first off, I'm gonna reiterate this a lot. Purge objects from your mind. Just don't think, don't think about them. Forget that they exist. I think a big part of why OOP is so attractive is that it's easy to visualize objects. And like, I'm a visual person too, but I understand it. Uh, so I like to visualize entities as kind of like a key ring, and the components are like keys or keychains or something. So the key ring itself is kind of irrelevant, it just kind of keeps your data together. You can put a bunch of components on any entity you like, like which, you know, what you can do with a keychain. The difference though is that an entity is really just an index into an array of component data. This is actually a much more accurate representation of the same data layout from the keychain doodle. And if it looks an awful lot like a database, that's because it is. Uh, having an in-memory database lets us query for specific sets of component data. And we call these component type sets just archetypes. And they, they actually kind of serve as a functional equivalent to objects that we're also used to kind of, uh, but without the mental and computational overhead. In fact, this actually kind of gives us greater flexibility because we can kind of create whole new types on the fly that an OOP would require making a whole new class, which then would eventually crystallize into the rat's nest you saw earlier. And keep in mind also, you almost never need all the pieces of component data on like a single entity like this in a single job if you have a lot of different components on one entity. So really quick example, let's just say you have like a simple, simple zombie melee game and you just have like zombies running at you and you punch them to death, I don't know. So you have that and you just you just calculate some damage, right? You don't need the sound effects or whatever during this processing step, so let's just ask for the component data associated with the entities that have all three of these components. A local to world matrix, health, and a hitbox. Now you may be thinking, that's cool, that should give me great cache utilization while I'm processing damage, but how do I differentiate between a player and an enemy without types? Well, in ECS, Instead of differentiating between things by object type, we can use tag components and just use those to make specific archetypes. Uh, tag components are just empty structs, so you don't waste any space in your actual arrays of component data, but you can use them in archetype queries to make, you know, for example, different kinds of enemies or players. But it also means that you don't have to differentiate different kinds of component data, so you don't have to have like player health and enemy health. So this is actually more reusable than the classic inheritance example we talked about earlier. Uh, since we can easily get the data that we need for specific jobs, we don't need to ask job, or we don't need to ask objects to process themselves. That's actually absurd. Uh, Data-oriented design is more like cooking, and if you think about it that way, the absurdity really comes out. So, you know, let's take an example. You take some input, data like flour and sugar and eggs and chocolate and chips and whatever and you put them through a mixing system, job, whatever, is your, your, part of your cookie maker system, and you get as an output, cookie dough. Cookies can't make themselves, let alone cookie dough, though if you don't know about some uh, self-creating cookies, please see me afterwards. In ECS systems, uh, in ECS systems you create will run automatically if they have the right ingredients. So like, if you don't have the set of components you need for a system, then it just won't run. Much like you can't run the mixed chocolate chip cookie system if you don't have chocolate chips. So also like cooking, if you think about your data dependencies, you can parallelize tasks to get more done faster. If you make a gigantic vat of cookie dough, you know, you're gonna have to ha bake several batches unless you have some massive oven. The baking task depends on a tray of raw cookies as input, but scooping the cookie dough doesn't depend on the oven, so assuming you have enough cookie sheets, you can scoop while another batch is baking. I've also found that drawing out data like this to think about your dependencies 
really, really helps when you're breaking up work into separate jobs. Uh, so we're coming to the end here, and I want to just leave you with this. OP, object oriented programming, is really just what we're used to. It's not necessarily good at what we need it for, though. Data oriented design is admittedly, it's very different. But it's exactly what we need for solving the problems that we're always encountering when developing games. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, just remember to take time to examine how you think about your data and functionality and ask yourself, what problem am I actually trying to solve at as high a resolution you can? And that's it. Does anyone have questions? No? Nope. All right, I'm going to be in the uh, answer bar area answering questions about ECS and the like after this. So uh, if you do have questions, go hit me up. See ya.